The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, welcome to, to the webinar. I'm the moderator for today's webinar. I'm Abby Henry, I'm the Oncology Content Manager for Pearl Point Cancer Support. First, let me introduce you to our speakers. First, we will hear from Jalisa Boyd and Katie Navarde, both from Sarah Cannon's Survivorship Navigation Team. Jalisa has been a registered nurse for 16 years, and her passion truly is in caring for people. She worked in ICU, cardiac rehab, diabetes education, infection prevention, and community health. She holds a master's degree in community health with a focus on prevention. Jalisa is also a part of the Sarah Cannon HCA survivorship team, which includes herself and a social worker. As the survivorship nurse navigator, her role with patients begins once their active treatment ends or is maintained. The survivorship team is also a part of many community events, including psychoeducational classes, dialogue groups, and community symposiums. Katie is a licensed social worker, oncology navigator, and young adult caregiver. Following her husband's cancer treatment at MD Anderson, Katie became an advocate for caregivers, speaking, writing, and volunteering her time in an effort to increase awareness of caregiver struggles. Most recently, after working nationally and internationally in a variety of different areas, Katie changed career paths entirely and became an oncology survivorship navigator in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Our final speaker today is Margaret Martin, Pearl Point's nutrition educator and registered dietitian. Margaret is a licensed dietitian and nutritionist in the state of Tennessee, as well as a certified diabetes educator. Margaret graduated from the University of Alabama with a Bachelor of Science in Dietetics and received her master's degree in nutrition science and public health from the University of Tennessee. She has more than 10 years of experience in clinical nutrition. And if you have any questions during the webinar, you can submit them in the panel on the right side of your screen. Our presenters will be answering questions after the presentation. You can also connect with us on Twitter using the handle at MyPearlPoint, or you can use the hashtag PPCSWebinar. After the webinar, just please complete the survey that will pop up at the end so that we can improve our webinars and better serve you. Here you can take a quick look at our agenda for today. We'd also like to take a moment to thank the Memorial Foundation for helping make today's webinar possible. A quick disclaimer, Pearl Point Cancer Support is not a treatment facility. We're a nonprofit organization that provides education and resources for cancer survivors. The webinar does not provide medical care, so always talk to your healthcare team before changing your diet or your care or if you have any side effects from treatment. So who is Pearl Point Cancer Support? We're a nonprofit support organization with the mission to create a more confident cancer journey for adults anytime, anywhere. We've been serving survivors, co-survivors, and healthcare professionals for over 28 years. We provide education and resources through MyPearlPoint, a website dedicated to educating cancer survivors. Our main focuses are cancer education, clinical trials, nutrition, and survivorship. You can visit MyPearlPoint after the webinar to create a free dashboard and receive personal personalized resource such as the Cancer Handbook, which we currently have available for multiple cancer types, and we also have a Survivorship Handbook. You can also learn more about side effect management by watching the Eat to Fight video series. On the homepage, just click on Nutrition and Cancer, and that will take you to the section to find the videos. And so who is Sarah Cannon? Sarah Cannon offers integrated cancer services with convenient access to cutting-edge therapies for cancer patients across the U.S. and the U.K. Sarah Cannon brings together renowned cancer experts to share best practices for addressing every aspect of the cancer journey, screening, diagnosis, treatment, and survivorship, so that patients receive excellent care and improved outcomes. So now I'm going to hand things over to Jolly and Katie. Thank you very much, Abby. Well, before we get started, we want to define survivorship. And the National Cancer Institute defines it from the time of diagnosis until the end of life. However, the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship created the definition cancer survivorship to describe a broad experience on the cancer continuum. And this is the living with, living through, and living beyond the cancer diagnosis. And as, I, as you can see from the slide, there's four um, organizations that really support this definition. So again, by this definition, they also agree that cancer survivorship begins at the moment of diagnosis. However, it also includes uh, people who continue to receive treatment to either reduce the risk of recurrence or to manage cancer as a chronic disease. Next. So 
So historically, the diagnosis of the C word was patients with all types of cancers were more likely to die than to survive. Medical professionals in the past used to only focus on the diagnosis and really did not educate um, family members, patients about the effects of the long-term side effects from treatment. But today, due to great early detection, new advances in medicine and therapies, the focus has really moved towards a wellness focus. Next. So today we're going to focus on three areas of survivorship health physical, mental, and social. So physical, focusing on the side effects from treatments, medications, stress activity, and immune functions. The mental aspects, the fear of recurrence, the coping skills, um, and mental illnesses. And then lastly, the social, which is the social support, socioeconomic status, education, and employment. Next. So mental health, fear of recurrence. That is the, one of the top things that patients who are, once they hit the survivorship state, that is one of their biggest fears is, will this happen again? They tend to feel a lack of control over their lives and they really struggle with mistrusting their body. So anytime they have an ache or pain, they automatically um, diagnose themselves as having cancer again. So some recommendations is just to assure them um, that their medical team is monitoring them their health as long as they are doing those very important prevention visits and follow-up visits. Um, encourage them to express their emotions, whether it's through counseling, very support groups, or to friends and family. Um, another big thing to focus on is refocus them to what is controllable. What can they control in their life? They can make the appointments, keep their appointments, being involved in their health care, and their nutrition, which Margaret will talk about more in just a few moments, but those are some of the things that they can control. And then lastly, su suggest that they get more active and look for the positives in each day. Next. Now, the memory and or concentration problems. Sometimes cancer treatments such as chemo, um, biological, and radiation therapies, they may create difficulties in thinking, concentrating, or recalling information. Um, probably common to hear that once someone is going through chemo, they talk about chemo brain. But something that um, we see in other populations is that after the treatment, after they are done with their chemo, um, then they can get the chemo brain after. Um, so again, that's educating the patients once that does occur. Um, some recommendations, just referring them to a specialist who can help assess and then treat these side effects. And so organizational ideas, such as have a day planner, carry a paper and pen with them, have sticky notes, or on the telephones, you have a recorder. So if you just let your going through the day record, um, record yourself saying, saying things that you don't want to forget. And then lastly, encourage both mental and physical exercise. Next. As far as physical health, chronic fatigue. That fatigue that when you rest, it does not go away. Um, this is very exhausting. They can talk about they're heavy, they're run down, and have absolutely no energy. Some suggestions uh, for the survivors is to make a plan that balances your rest and light activity. Um, initially, they may want to keep a log of when they feel that their energy is the highest, whether it's in the morning or if they um, do all of their activities throughout the day scattered with naps in between. They just need to figure out, and again, this will help with helping them be in control of what works best for them. Um, encourage better nutritional habits, such as foods that are higher in protein. And then as well, refer them to survivors if needed, such as social workers, counselors, because stress can also help with this fatigue. It can make it worse. Next. And then chronic pain. Many survivors believe that chronic pain is something they just have to learn to live with. They have to put up with it. Uh, pain can suppress the immune system. It can slow healing time, interfere with sleep, and affect mood, which can also affect fatigue, which is just a domino effect. Um, again, this is something that survivors can track their pain levels. And pain throughout the day, is there something that triggers it, makes it better, makes it worse? Um, reinforce them that they do not, should not have to deal with the pain, that they need to seek, um, whether it's a pain specialist, a physician and pain specialist, um, 
various integrative medicines like acupuncture, biofeedback, massage therapy, physical therapy, um, look at the different options that they can turn to so they don't have to experience pain. Next. Okay, and so now we're going to continue on to social health. As Jalisa said earlier, social health refers to social support like families, friends, groups that the survivor is a part of, also cultural traditions, what are a person's familial roles and their roles within the community, socioeconomic status, education, and also employment. Um, a lot of survivors after treatment ends feel very isolated because family and friends often think that once treatment ends, then everything is going to go back to the way it was before. Um, and they're, it's hard for them to accept this new normal in their relationships. So our recommendations for this are referring the survivor and their family to a social worker, counselor, psychologist to help them establish new family roles, also empowering survivors to speak openly with friends and families about their needs and physical limits, um, and also, most importantly, encouraging connections with other survivors, either locally or at conferences or even online, um, a good one-on-one -on -one mentoring program is Immerman Angels, and that you can register online, and then um, survivors and patients and caregivers will be connected with others that have similar situations as themselves. Okay, next. So then we have financial stress, and financial stress, stress is one of the greatest stressors for survivors during and also after treatment, right? Once treatment ends, the bills just keep rolling in. So our recommendations are really seeking financial counseling. Um, the purpose of financial counselors are to help them kind of think outside of the box when it comes to payments. And also encourage survivors to create monthly budgets that include reasonable payments on their medical bills. Uh, a good example that I'll give is if a patient is spending $300 a month on eating out, a financial counselor might help them reorganize their budget and instead spend less on eating out and use that remaining money towards their medical bills. Okay, next. <clears throat> and finally, in social health, we have intimacy. Um, <clears throat> during, and, during and after treatment, um, feelings towards intimacy may change due to fatigue and body image and also all the various stress factors that go along with treatment. Um, our recommendations here are to encourage the survivor to build their own self-esteem by doing things that are good for their body, eating healthy foods, exercising, drinking plenty of water, and also trying out new activities to build confidence. You know, if they've never tried swimming, maybe taking a swimming class or trying a new exercise class, of course, always staying within their physical limits. Um, also suggest scheduling a specific time when energy is highest for intimacy. So again, going back to that log that Jalisa spoke of earlier, if your energy is high in the middle of the day and your partner's around, trying intimacy then is a great idea. Um, recommend engaging in activities that will bring the survivor and caregiver closer together. These are besides that physical, sexual intimacy, but cuddling, holding hands, kissing, doing activities together, um, and also referring, again, referring couples to a counselor who is specifically versed in intimacy issues to develop communication techniques. Next slide, please. And so um, Jalisa and I, in our roles as survivorship navigators here in Dallas-Fort Worth, we developed a needs assessment together to get an idea of the needs in each of our communities around our eight hospitals. So DFW is, is a huge area, and we have eight HCA hospitals here. And so we developed this needs assessment. We give it to all survivors who finished active treatment and who are in a maintenance phase. And to get an idea of um, 
what the individual needs outside of just their diagnosis. Again, looking at the person in a multidimensional way, um, we, uh, we cover different topics. So what are their physical needs? Um, do they have body changes, appetite or weight issues? Socially, what about sex and intimacy, returning to work, um, handling their debt, emotionally, fear and sadness, parenting concerns, and then spiritually, loss of faith and end-of-life concerns. Then after that, we ask them questions about how would they prefer that educational information be communicated to them. Do they like written material about managing financial burdens? Do they want to meet in small groups or do they prefer to watch videos? Do they want a referral to a healthcare specialist or do they want to hear what another cancer survivor has done in their own journey? And then again, we leave an open option for any other way that we might not have thought of. Okay, next. And so then after that, we asked about everyday communication. So say if we had a newsletter um, or an email letter that we, we sent out, what kind of things would you want to hear about? What kind of topics would survivors be interested in? Um, you can see them all list, listed right here on your screen. Um, and then not included on this slide, we also asked how often would the survivor like communication from their survivorship team, which is Julissa and I. Do they want in-person meetings, phone calls, emails? And how often, weekly, monthly, quarterly, as they get further and further um, away from treatment and into a healthy survivorship, they might want to hear from us less, maybe only yearly. Um, and then the last questions that we asked uh, were dealing with where would the survivors be willing to travel. As I said, DFW is a large area. So if they're in Dallas, would they be willing to travel to Fort Worth for classes or support groups? Um, how far would they be willing to travel? And so again, this is just a large overview of the needs assessment, but Jalisa and I have used these needs assessments to then start developing support groups um, in each area of DFW. So if Arlington, for instance, said they had a high need of smoking cessation, then we would start courses there about that. Um, OK, next slide. So as medical professionals, we always want to encourage patients in survivorship to get their prevention screenings and to stay in good health. But it's also important to recognize that the patient and caregiver health is directly related. So the healthier the caregiver is, the healthier the patient, their quality of life tends to be, and vice versa. Um, so it's also important for us to encourage our patients family, partners, caregivers, friends, to practice healthy habits as well. Those that take care of the survivor and are in direct contact with them, we should also be encouraging them to get um, their prevention screening. Next slide. And so healthy eating habits are important for everyone, but people with cancer often have special concerns. Registered dietitians provide up-to-date research-based nutrition advice throughout cancer treatment and onto survivorship. Once treatment is complete, nutrition remains an important part of survivorship. And at this point, we're going to pass the presentation over to Margaret. Thank you very much, Jaleesa and Katie, for that important information about survivorship. It's my pleasure to be with you today for the webinar. Listening today, we have cancer survivors, caregivers, and healthcare professionals. I appreciate the opportunity to now present some nutrition strategies that our listeners can put into practice to enjoy survivorship. In survivorship, healthy nutrition remains an important choice. From uh, For our webinar today, survivor nutrition includes how you eat, the food choices you often make, physical activity, and your body weight or body size. So let's get started with some nutrition goals that cancer survivors may choose. Next slide. 
great. There are many goals you might have in survivorship related to nutrition. It's important to have a goal or two to achieve before you go about selecting food strategies. Here are some goals I often hear as I speak to cancer survivors and caregivers. And then you decide what the most important nutrition goal can be for you in survivorship. Increased energy is the most frequent goal we hear. Increased energy may be for new habits, uh, new sports, or new, uh, new classes you may want to take. But more importantly, having energy again, maybe to cook your own meals, go grocery shopping independently, or walking for longer distances. Another goal might be to get back to routines, routines, hobbies, and social outings that you love but may have missed during cancer and cancer treatment. Or are you considering a return to work or to be a volunteer again? Um, these routines are very important to help us feel connected to life and give us satisfaction. Also very important, a goal might be to lower your risk for cancer recurrence. Cancer um, risk occur uh, before cancer as well as after cancer. Eating well and being physically active can impact both of those ends of the spectrum. Another goal might be to enjoy food again. Maybe some old food favorites or maybe trying some new flavors. Taste buds often are changed or damaged during cancer and cancer treatment. So it's a great time to be open to new food and flavors. Maybe some food you didn't like before cancer may be pleasant and uh, flavorful for you. So be open to those new experiences. Um, before sometimes we can advance to other goals, clients may need to work through any nutrition, cancer-related side effects, uh, such as swallowing issues, appetite changes, or digestive problems. And you may need personal help to deal with these from a registered dietitian. <clears throat> Finally, uh, one goal I hear quite often is to get to a healthier weight. Often cancer and cancer treatment changes weight. You can address this during survivorship to work toward a body size that's more comfortable and healthier for you. Uh, comfortable so you might could get back to some old routines and maybe enjoy uh, physical activity again. And we'll talk about that a little bit in here in a little bit. Now that you have a goal in mind, let's look at some nutrition strategies you can adopt to help you reach your goal. Next slide. All right. Survivorship strategies for nutrition often start with the cancer prevention tips um, by scientific organizations. Um, they deal with eating less fat, eating more fruits and vegetables, um, as well as many other recommendations. So we'll look at those here in a minute. Another strategy might be dealing with any eating issues that are left over from your cancer treatment that we mentioned before, like appetite changes. Um, maybe you've developed some food intolerances during treatment. Uh, perhaps you're not able to use uh, milk products or digest fiber like you used to. So strategies around those issues are very important. And finally, survivorship strategies are also linked with your healthcare team. Get suggestions and input from your healthcare team about any eating and digestive issues you may have, and ask them for a referral to a registered dietitian in your area that has experience with cancer treatment. Next slide. All right. Well, let's look at what some of the nutritional recommendations might be for survivorship nutrition. Most of them deal with the recommendation for cancer prevention. Um, some of the scientific, scientific organizations like the American Institute for Cancer Research uh, publish these recommendations. Probably the most well-known is called the New American Plate. Also, we've heard about the Mediterranean diet and the heart-healthy menus. These are all great places to start to help reduce your nutrition uh, or cancer risk in survivorship and to be more healthy. Um, thinking about the new American plate, 
the illustration there on the right is one way to think about what your plate might look like if you're trying to eat more healthfully in survivorship. Growing up, often we thought about our dinner plate might be uh, covered halfway by meat or protein, like meat, red meat, chicken, fish, um, and the other one-fourth might be vegetables and the other fourth might be greens. Now it's suggested that we reorder our plate at meals, make only a third of the plate from animal protein, beans, or dairy. Two-thirds of your plate is recommended to be from vegetables, fruits, and, and whole grains. This is a very low-fat, high-nutrition way of eating, which also makes you feel well. It also helps reduce negative hormones, tumor growth factors, inflammation, and other cancer risk. Um, also, eating less meat and more vegetables and whole grains and fruits helps you limit the harmful type of fat called saturated fat. Since many folks in survivorship are f facing other health issues as they go through life, like diabetes and heart health and circulation issues, it's great to keep a cap on those saturated fats. <clears throat> so think about changing your plate visually and in real life, to eat more fruits, vegetables, grains, and a third or less of your plate from animal protein. Next slide. <clears throat> now, one part of survivorship nutrition may have to do with portion sizes. Portion distortion or extra large food portions can lead to excessive calories, fat, and salt. These extras can increase your risk for heart disease, diabetes, and uh, cancer reoccurrence. So let's think about, are you dealing with cancer, or excuse me, portion distortion? Um, portion distortion occurs because over time, what we see as servings in restaurants and fast food establishments have greatly uh, blossomed. In the 1970s, a serving of french fries was very small, about an ounce or two. What we now see as the french fry serving in a Happy Meal or a kid's meal at a fast food restaurant. Um, portions are about 300 calories more than they used to when you go out to eat at a restaurant. So you can see how eating healthier, more balanced portion sizes can help you lead to a healthier body weight, reduce cancer risk, and all around increase sense of well-being. Let's look at our next slide. To think about what portion distortion looks like, let's match the food on the left with the recommended portion sizes on the right. These portion sizes um, are visualized by using everyday things we might have in our life. For instance, the pencil is about the size of a recommended uh, medium banana. The baseball is the size of about one cup of fruits or vegetables, cooked or raw. Uh, the golf ball represents a healthy serving size of nuts, which is about one-fourth cup of nuts. A smartphone is a, is a serving size of about three ounces of cooked lean meat. And finally, a computer mouse is the size of about a small baked potato, which would be a healthy size for many people. Using visual cues like this helps you control your portion sizes so you'll be taking in more of the healthy foods and less of the uh, calorie rich foods. Next slide. Now thinking about portion sizes, next leads us into what are some serving size suggestions for a day for, of healthy foods. The U.S. Department of Agriculture, or USDA, publishes a lot of great nutrition information on their website, um, Rate My Plate, and this is just one of the suggested number of serving size charts. Um, it's suggested for cancer survivors to get eight to 10 uh, servings of fruits and vegetables daily as a general suggestion. So for women, that might translate into one and a half of two cups of fruit a day, 
and two to two and a half cups of vegetables a day. For men, that might mean two cups of fruit a day and two and a half to three cups of vegetables a day, just as an example. So portion sizes and recommended servings of food per day is one, one way to go about thinking, what should I eat? in survivorship to help me be healthy and have energy. Healthy, healthy foods and healthy portion sizes also it's great to support a healthy weight. Some forms of cancer are strongly tied to our weight. Um, breast cancer survivors who were overweight found in one study that just losing 5% of their current body weight helped reduce their incidence a reoccurrence of cancer. So for a 180 pound woman, that was just a weight loss of nine pounds, which is pretty doable for most people. Also, talking about food and nutrients, be sure to get your nutrition from food itself, not relying on dietary supplements. Most research on food and nutrition is done on nutrients from food eaten not from nutrients from capsules or vitamin supplements. In fact, mega doses of some nutrients in survivorship is counterproductive or dangerous. So enjoy nutrition from tasty foods, not from dietary supplements. Next slide, please. Now let's get down to some other specific strategies you might use during survivorship. One is to be meat savvy or be, be smart about what proteins and meats you do choose. Uh, the American Institute of Cancer Research recommends that you eat less than 18 ounces of red meat weekly. Red meat is a healthy food. It contains iron that's very absorbable, but it also carries saturated fat and some other, other nutrients that tend to increase cancer risk. So, be careful about how much red meat you eat. Instead, enjoy poultry, fish, and non-meat protein sources like beans, peas, nuts, and seeds. Thinking about meat, avoid processed and smoked meats. Processed meats like deli foods like Malona and wieners, smoked meat like bacon and sausages and ham have carry rather known carcinogens, so it's better to avoid those altogether. And go fishing, or eat fish at least eight ounces or more weekly. Uh, fish is rich in omega-3 fatty acids and can help reduce your risk of inflammation and increase your heart health. They also tend to be low in the bad fat called saturated fat. So healthy fish like cod, salmon, tuna, white fish, or just a few of the fish that are suggested. You can grill them, bake them, uh, use them in casseroles. Uh, tuna salad is a favorite in the summer. The options are limitless. So get your fish in each week. Next slide. Get variety and whole grains throughout the week. Try to get a variety of colorful fruits and vegetables. It's a whole new world with food color. Growing up, we often were told to get at least one orange and one green uh, vegetable every other day. Now we know there are more than nine healthy colors of foods, like fruits and vegetables. So get a variety each week. Red, green, yellow, purple, brown, white, orange, or just a few. When you go to the store to get your, your vegetables, Instead of buying a whole great big bag of one fruit, maybe get two, two pieces of different fruit so you'll have a variety for the week. Fresh is often recommended, but canned and cooked fruits and vegetables are just as nutritious. One example is tomatoes. Tomatoes are a great source of lycopene, one of our antioxidants. You would have to eat eight fresh tomatoes to get the same amount of lycopene that can be found in two-thirds cup of cooked tomato sauce. So be smart and conserve your energy. Instead of eating eight fresh tomatoes, which is wonderful, it might be more um, 
sufficient to have tomato sauce on whole grain pasta tonight. Think about whole grains. How could you add them to meals and snacks? Be sure to include whole grain cereals, brown rice, barley, and quinoa. In one study, 10 grams of additional dietary fiber for some cancer survivors reduced their cancer recurrence to 18%. That's very significant. If you can tolerate fiber from grains and produce, it's a great way to also reduce your cancer reoccurrence. Plus, whole grains are filling. They're very satisfying, and they can help you control your hunger until the next meal. Finally, boost your bean and pea intake. Beans and peas once were just thought of as a side dish or something we put um, on the plate uh, along with rice or grains. But beans and peas can be your main dish now or your entree. Flavor them with onions, spices, herbs, things uh, that can bring out the best in beans and peas. Think about new, new ways you might use them. Stir them into a soup or casserole, uh, sprinkle them on top of a salad, or think of nut butters. Those are uh, and bean, they are also making some new bean appetizers like hummus. They're a great way to use those. If you're not into using beans and peas often, think about using them in casseroles where you don't taste them as well, or in soups. Next slide. Now let's think about some add-ons. Add-ons can be thought of as things we might use as beverages or for seasoning our foods. And these sometimes can increase our cancer or health risk for other conditions. The first is alcohol. Limit your alcohol, if you use it at all, to one drink daily for women or up to two drinks uh, equivalent for men. Um, alcohol is linked to some types of cancer and is often seen as empty or, or very low nutrient beverages. Instead of alcohol, think about having green tea. Green tea is full of antioxidants. Steep it for two to four minutes to get the maximum amount of antioxidants and have tea throughout the day instead of high sugar beverages or alcohol in the evening. In place of salt, try using herbs and spices. This is a great time of year to think about having your own herb garden or maybe just a small box of herbs on your patio. Salt has been linked to side effects like water retention and hypertension in survivorship. So think fresh and use herbs and spices instead of salt. And finally, think about swapping out sweet foods and sweetened drinks with fruit and fruit, fruit flavored drinks. You can go natural and try fruit as a dessert or whip up a beverage smoothie or a light spritzer with fruit juice with a carbonated beverage. Sugar is linked to excess weight and can add to inflammation and blood sugar issues. So be smart and go natural when flavoring your foods for sweetness. Next slide. Now let's think about physical activity or movement. Physical activity and cancer has been greatly researched. Physical activity can help you rebuild your lean body tissue known as muscle which may have been lost during cancer treatment. Muscle, as you know, gives strength. It can also help you improve your immunity and aid you in weight control and survivorship. Physical activity also helps renew our body energy, known as glycogen, and gives us an increased stamina for the activities we want to enjoy. Physical activity, as was mentioned before, is a great stress management tool and may help with a sense of well-being or happiness for many people. Physical activity supports a healthy heart and blood sugar level, which is important as we go through life. Now, what is thought of as physical activity? Well, some examples might be biking, walking, swimming, vigorous gardening, continuous house or lawn care, dancing, flying a kite, 
or even golfing without a golf cart. Whatever you could enjoy that you could increase your heart rate for 10 to 20 minutes might be one another definition of physical activity. Um, if you're not used to being active, try to add 10 to 15 minutes of activity two or three times a day to get back into shape. A recommendation by many health groups is 30 minutes of physical activity uh, on most days of the week at a moderate level of activity. This helps maintain the health you have currently. If you're interested in controlling and reducing your weight, other health groups suggest that you increase that to 45 minutes or an hour of physical activity several days a week. If you're not feeling up to physical activity or not sure it would be safe yet for you to exercise, ask your health care team for a referral to a physical therapist for an exercise plan. Many physical therapists are experts at exercise plans during rehabilitation during the survivorship phase. So in summary, survivorship nutrition is making small progressive food choices and activity choices that give you the energy and the nutrients you want to enjoy life while reducing your risk for fun and illness. Choices may include starting the day with a whole grain cereal, it may be grabbing a fruit for a snack, being active for 30 to 45 minutes on most days, perhaps adding a dried bean to a salad, grilling your meat instead of frying it, drinking green tea in place of alcohol or sodas, and choosing a meatless meal more often during the week. Start today and make healthy food and physical activity choices for your survivorship. And of course, we have more nutrition ideas online on our website. Now, Abby, back to you. Hey, thank you, Margaret. Thank you to all our presenters. Um, okay, so just remember, you can visit mypearlpoint.org for more resources for your cancer journey. Um, you're also welcome to join us for our next webinar. It'll be on July 21st. Um, our topic is still to be determined, but um, make sure to check our social media for more information on that. And for even more help with side effect management, you can download our free mobile app to your smartphone or tablet. The Cancer Side Effects Helper app is available on iTunes and Google Play. The app offers quick tips to help you manage side effects such as nausea, fatigue, and change in taste and smell. So now let's take some questions. Let's see, um, I think the first question I have is actually for Katie and Jalisa. Um, what are some examples of mental exercises I can do to help with chemo brain? Well, there's a lot of apps now, like Luminosity, um, that you can actually do on your phone that do puzzles thinking games, even doing games like Sudoku, um, anything that kind of gets your mind active and working and solving puzzles, that can help with chemo brain. Thank you. Um, let's see, the next one is for Margaret. Um, some of my friends suggest going vegetarian to be healthier. Should I become a vegetarian after I finish cancer treatment? That's a great question, Abby. I get that one quite often. Um, vegetarianism is a healthy way of eating. It, it, to some people, means eating no meat. However, there is a lot of planning that revolves around eating without meat or dairy. I don't usually suggest to people to become a vegetarian unless they were before they had cancer. I think a healthier and easier pattern of food habits might be to eat less meat or smaller portions of, of meat while increasing your intake of fruits and vegetables. Um, so th I think it, it's not necessary to become vegetarian, but just be wise about your meat and uh, fat choices. 
Okay, it looks like we have one more question, and this one is also from Margaret. Um, I hear a lot about fiber. How much fiber do I need? All right, fiber, generally in America, the average American eats maybe 10 to 15 grams of fiber a day. Many of our health organizations recommend 20 to 35 grams of fiber daily. If you're a lady, you know, the recommendation might be, you know, 20 to 30. And then the male or highly active female, the recommendation might be towards the 35 grams a day. If you're not used to eating fiber, say you've had uh, gastric or intestinal surgery, your fiber intake may be modified for that. So it just depends on your situation, but for most healthy people, 30, excuse me, 20 to 35 grams a day is a great suggestion. Okay, looks like that's all the questions I have. Um, thank you again to our presenters for an informative presentation, and thank you to you all for attending today's webinar. I hope you all have a great rest of the week.